by rather than what they accept a couple of textbooks. But Belltown, which is really in the Owens Mills area, uh, it's, it's been there since slavery. You know, that's when it was all Colgate Road and that's well now. Oh, okay, in that area. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And that, that brought them all in there looking, looking for more. Uh, so, uh, the church, church has been there since, uh, well, at least 1884. When they didn't build a church, they rented an area from a gentleman. But they eventually built a church. Unfortunately, the church caught fire and was destroyed, and they rebuilt the church. Blacks lived only a few of them on Colgate Road and primarily a road down there called Featherbed Lane. Uh -huh. Featherbed Lane contained uh, a lodge. I don't remember the name of the lodge, but it also served as a school. Mm -hmm. um, there were several black families back there, but there were never a heck of a lot. Never. But the church. It existed for years as a circuit church. I believe it was associated with uh, uh, the Union Bethlehem Church and uh, a church in Campfield, uh, mm -hmm. and the church. And it eventually broke into its, its own. But I, and I don't have many pictures. I have not been able to contact many people uh, that I could interview. And, uh, I'm trying to share share images. Uh, I was able to interview uh, uh, his well as that dog and they slips me uh, who um, he just talked about it. Who? That one's in Belltown. G G oh G Clash Clash Figs and Mr. G. Yeah. He was the one that talked yeah, a long time. Yeah. And one other lady who lived on Colgate Road and she moved into the city. Those were the only two I could basically run down. Mm -hmm. I found it very difficult because they were obviously so far apart that time ran out of me trying to get that particular book, mm -hmm. particular book uh, finished. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons was because, and this is why I like the idea of being on there, my first place is missing. Missed her name, but she wanted to break. She is a Owens descendant, and I got so tired of her wanting to know about the slaves and where did they lay the rest the uh, one that they favored, the ones the slaves that worked in the houses. And uh, it is really nice. Oh, she shared a lot with me, but uh, it, all that tied me up. This is a, and I have to know more about why did they have a structure like that? But that's the current one. Mm -hmm. Oh, the one that was burned down, I believe it was in 25, and I couldn't get a clear picture of what the original church looked like. Mm -hmm. And this is when it was, they were rebuilding the church. Mm -hmm. And this is Mr. G with his, and Dr. Statton. She was the other lady. And uh, the community is still in, I dare say. Uh, if there are five families back there, it would be fortunate. There's one right on the corner of, of uh, Colgate and uh, Mount Pleasant. That's uh, not There's a black man there, but he came to have his house designated. Historic. And of course, it was long after I'd written the book. And I was able to pay a lot of information about him. Like I said, a lot of times about it, you know, after you've done the book. So, if you two would like to talk a little bit of anything at all about Mount Pleasant or Belltown, we'd appreciate it. Please. And give us a name to the side of you so it addresses. Yeah. <laughs> you have just as many facts as I have. Um, um, I, I, I 
been there 18 years, but based on the bits and pieces and all, and we have a couple of really good historians, but they're not here today, and I couldn't get in touch with them, but it would really be nice, and maybe we could schedule another time when they come out, <clears throat> they can come out and give you more, because everything you have here, um, I, I, I've, been, I've learned a couple little things myself, like I said, Belltown, I didn't know it was called Belltown. Um, but yeah, the church was burnt down. You know, we had two uh, fires there, and the church originally, they said, was facing Tollgate Road. When they rebuilt it, they uh, got it on the side, and that's a, that's Tollgate Road where the, the circle the is. Front, that's, yeah. uh -huh, that's the yeah. That's the yeah. The front oh, is around. Picture on the left. Yeah, that's the yeah, front right, right there. That's yeah. Tollgate. Yeah, yeah, that's Tollgate Road. That's basically the side. It's the front of the church, but the side of the building because the front entrance is. It's around that side. Yeah. Yeah. But um how long has this cemetery been there? Do you have any idea? Oh god. Very large cemetery. Yeah, it's a pretty good sized cemetery. Um I think the church really dates back to like eighteen sixty seven or something like that. That's, um we just had a um, they kind of guesstimated the date when it was like hundred twenty third anniversary we had a little game up for that. Mm -hmm. 24, 123 years anniversary for the church. But um, yeah, the cemetery is there. We still have a few people that have family in the cemetery that still go to the church. Wow. Um, at least I can tell you more than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, for your information, the book that I'm working on now, my 13th book, is every community that I went into document yeah. Yeah, the legs came off. Um, uh, every community I surveyed at the cemetery. And as you know, nowadays researching your roots is very popular. Mm -hmm. And lots of people don't do not realize that Baltimore County uh, today is not like it was a couple hundred years ago. Right. They don't realize that five counties were cut from Baltimore County. Mm -hmm. Cecil County, Carroll County, Frederick County, Howard County. Oh. They didn't come out of Baltimore yes, County. Really. Wow. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Well, what I have done is I have accumulated 30 years of surveying up the cemetery into one large book that people can just go into the index wow. and maybe find their answers. That's awesome. At least the way to go in the book. These things will put a research That's way It's his work from the digital. Uh, they start researching their That's why I was asking is that being digitalized. So but, but every church, and I even have a little max, to show how to get to different, different churches. And I always share with people who want information from some of the books containing the cemetery. I'd send them the images, you know, with definitely no problem. But uh, that's one of the larger ones. Yes. Well kept. And I'm going to say to say it's only one church that I wanted for that had their, kept their records. Really nice too. You wonder not all about this church up in uh, Towson and on Bond Avenue, mm. St. Luke's. Yeah, they have great records. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so now I'm going to shift now to. Oh, and, and back to. I was going to say something there, about that. Uh, images that I've collected from the. Um, in the Belltown area. Okay, this last one, I'm not even, no, I, got the pit, I have to see how the picture, but it's Piney Grove United Methodist Church up in Barn Avenue. That's where my ancestors come from. Cool. Uh, I was born in Baltimore City, but it just happened that uh, uh, my Diggs family, <laughs> Well, my father was not a father. He was a father. He raised children in sperm. And he, he abandoned 
No, I, I, I know I'm going to be sorry for that. But, <laughs> but, but I, I like how you put that. Well, yeah. Right. I, I think when you yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Tell, tell it like it is, uh, Mr. Diggs. Tell it. But in any case, uh, this family was really easy to document. I want to be my mother's side, because they stuck together like grew, but I just couldn't do it from their side. But I've gone back so many generations on my father's side. And this Diggs family, along with uh, Derricks and Gwyns and quite a few families from up in that area, were easy to secure their records. Mm -hmm. But I can understand why my father was sent to the city when he was 13 years old. There was nine of them. And his father, Grant Diggs, met this woman. Uh, she was gorgeous, oh my goodness, much younger than him. He married her, they had nine straight babies, killed the mother, killed the father, four of the little infants had to be taken to uh, uh, Westminster to be reared. And 13 years old, they were on their own, that was my father, that's why we were born in Baltimore. Yes. What did you mean? They didn't last long. They couldn't even raise all the, the babies. So the baby died? No. no they, I mean, the parents died. The parents died. Because they were well, they okay. Were too many kids. No, okay. That baby really okay. killed. It, it killed both the father and the mother. Trying to raise all those kids that were trying to have them. all that children. <laughs> I don't even think they may have actually killed them. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> <laughs>
in the, I forgot the name of the map, John said when that map was produced in 1848, up to 10 years, things that had been going on there. So it could have been at least 10 years old before he even got on it. And sure enough, there was Pineville and Edmonton's church. They were slaves to the John B. Biggs families, D-I-G-G-E-S, who not only gave them freedom early on, but provided, helped them build Piney Grove Church. And uh, uh, they just kept the thing going all the while. And all of them participated in the wars up to, and I got pictures of them in the wartime. Oh, we got some of them back here. There's my great uncle Hilton Smith Diggs, and this guy was one of my, uh, he was my father's uncle. He was in France, loved it, single, enjoyed it, got out of the army, wanted to stay in France. All his sisters all just raised heads and know he got to come home. <laughs> Finally, he gave in to him. And went out to Piney Grove. Out Piney Grove area, there's a train that meanders through the community. And it goes really slow. The blacks that wanted to go to Piney Grove uh, jumped on the train and got there. You know, in the back of the church would jump off. That's what he did. Yeah. Oh, he took that before the train ran over. And his sisters never forgave himself. Uh, so he could have stayed on there. And this is how wow. Albert did well, I think he said you knew Albert down Mr. on the Big Spring Valley. Yeah, Mr. Diggs, that's his father? That's his father, yeah. Oh, okay. And he was in, uh, also in uh, World War I, an extremely handsome man. It's just like his dad. Uh, this young man right here, he got five of us, one of the things. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute, I told you he was too tight. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I was like, where's that African drum coming from? <laughs> yeah. yeah there, there were so many of these families, and all of them really kept Pine Grove Man with the church. Uh, it has a large cemetery, and the cemetery are right up to the wall of the church. Mm. And the family they wanted to add to expand the church. And, uh, they couldn't do it. The Lord was over here to help you see it. <laughs> so we got the approval of the front of the church to be extended on. We really need it, need it extended. And it contained an original one room schoolhouse that is still there, wow. still has the big pot belly stove, still had the, the chalkboards. Wow. Never changed, even today. And they're working on a hundred thousand dollar grant uh, to restore things, uh, and these are the things that we want to preserve so that we will always be able to take a look at, see things that are from the past. Uh, it's just a wonderful church. Not many blacks live up there now. Mm -hmm. The Fryer family, which is part of my family, they own fifty-two acres of land up there. But they had been uh, leasing that to white people the farm oh. over the years. It's still oh, okay. there. Okay. And my great great grandmother, who looked white, they their home they were using as a safe house for runaway slaves because they only lived in just a few miles in Johanna, Pennsylvania. Where they would go for slavery. Uh -huh. And the families, all, all of them were going there to have talk with them. They were so afraid for their mother and grandmother that, you know, they would be caught. But they were saying, every time something comes up, they always say, Grandma. So they, they you know, because she looked white. Mm -hmm. And they, mm -hmm. they never had to. Um, all of this is in, in, in the book. So uh, I don't think I need to go. So let's see. So this is Piney Grove. We're talking about Piney Grove. Mm -hmm. right here, okay. Piney Grove. Now where's actually Piney Grove located at now? Okay. You go up uh, Rice's Town Road. Mm -hmm. Or north. Okay, north. Okay, if you 
Rice Town Road makes a little turn and becomes Main Street. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm there. As you go up Main Street, maybe let's say six blocks on the big, on the left side is big, big church, big, big church. You can't possibly miss it. There's a road that stops right there. Otherwise, it's going to that. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, okay. I know it's going. Okay, yes. Okay. Keep on going. Okay. Until you get the big sign up saying left to uh, Westminster. Mm hmm. Yes. I can't think of the right one, but it's like you can't miss it. If it keeps going, mm -hmm. it does keep going, and it is you, uh, State Ride 130. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. You, of course, keep going. The only reason I mention that is because that's a significant point that most people refer to. So they get they got out of there, understand where they are right now. If they keep going for about another five or six miles, we would tell you from there, it's about seven miles up. Okay. And you run into a uh, pine you know, pine Can you know, look at the road? It's a big sign. And then you go to the right. You okay. cross the tracks twice. Before. They just meet off the little road. Okay. And it's okay. right there at Piney Road Road. Okay. Uh, uh, and it's been a hub of is the schoolhouse portion of it still open or is that a part that they're working on for restoration funding? They're working on it, but it is open. They use it as uh, uh, the lunch, uh, lunch area or conference area. Okay. I've got to show you the picture. That's where we went. Yeah, you see. Okay. Uh, this is uh, my family's home. Uh, it's, in, it's gone now. It was just what took it away. This was five family. They were closer to Glendon than they were to uh, Born. Okay. And this is part of, of Dick's family. I was, I was going to say this more of a comment. I wanted to thank you all for sharing the history. Um, I'm actually filming for my internet audience. I have about 1,700 people on this page. And then I share it into a group of about 45,000 um, African Americans who are all across the country um, who are interested in just the, his, the history and the facts. Um, one of the things that I wanted to say is this is important to our, our culture, to our understanding our past, to understanding yes. even where we're going in the future. Um, I know I've come across several people in what, I, what we call the millennial generation, um, and a lot of them have some very negative views about church. And some of them don't see the relevance or importance of the church. And this is actually so powerful to me because I've often said to them, um, if you don't understand your history, if you don't understand your connection, if you don't understand not just the faith aspect, but the historical records that are with churches, 
if you don't understand why people are trying to destroy historical churches. You don't understand why the Klan tries to burn down churches. This around us is the reason why, because your historical records are there. Um, birth records, marriage records, um, being able to trace your ancestry outside of, uh, outside of a DNA test. These records are super important. And there needs to be, you know, I wish I could just broadcast this on public broadcasting television or something, but I, I really think that the younger generation needs more understanding of the connection between the two. Um, because so many of them don't realize that if this history is gone, how are you going to look back? And um, so I just wanted to just thank you all for just sharing even the information you provided today. Um, very powerful, very impactful. Um, being able to go to a church that still has a one-room schoolhouse. You know, those are the things that the younger generation needs to hear and know and understand and be able to carry on the legacy. I don't consider myself a young person anymore because I'm past 40. <laughs> but... Um, but I'm just, I'm very thankful. No, she's not a millennial, that's what she said. Yeah, I'm not a millennial. <laughs> but I'm, I'm very thankful for the, the stories that I've heard today. Just how you talked about the free slaves and, and understanding that, yes, there were people who were being free before the Civil War, that they were getting land and granted. Those are things that we need to know and understand because a lot of that history isn't put out there. A lot of, um, I know African Americans that I know only really think about our freedom being granted through Emancipation Proclamation. They don't think about the hundreds and thousands of stories where people were being free much sooner than that. So I think this is important. So thank you again, Mr. Diggs. And you're so right about uh, how African American documented their history. Like, the old Bible, every time there was a birth, mm -hmm. it was written in the family Bible. Yes. So yes. every time there was a baptism or a Christian, it was documented in the church records. Mm -hmm. So that's how we documented our history back then. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the process of uh, looking at my family history. And I found out through, uh, you know, doing my genealogy and and, and uh, did my, I did my ancestor DNA test first. And I'm looking at this stuff, you know, like, I got German in me? You know, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering, where in the world did that come from? Yeah. But when I started doing my history, my father's uh, mother, uh, her grandmother was from Germany. Mm -hmm. I'm like, never knew that. And I was like, who is Martha Sunderland? And we have a picture of this lady, and I thought she was just a huge, fair-skinned, great big old woman, but that's how the German ladies looked, and mm -hmm. that was from that side. And I never even thought about mm -hmm. any other, and he had to say, that's why we're all different colors. Mm -hmm. Right, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did it come back? No, it didn't come back. Also, you know, the younger generation, um, you know, it's like, Technology has changed, so has the generation of our younger kids. And because the church has to change with each generation, they're not doing the traditional anymore. That's so right. you have to look at ways of <coughs> to attract them so that they will carry on the legacy. And mm -hmm. that's one thing that some churches kind of miss. And that's why you have Kirk Franklin's music is traditionally totally different than what it used to be back in the you know 50s and 60s so that's one thing we, we need to do is how do we pass the torch mm -hmm. so that the younger generation will take it on and it will be that new technology there mm -hmm. that will bring them into the church one thing i've noticed is that some of the churches are using these psychedelic lights and it's called church uproar and mm -hmm. things, which I couldn't get into so right. it's like okay alright that's not for me however 
It's how we pass the torch. We need to be, you know, uh, cognizant of how we're going to do that to keep our kids interested. Mm -hmm. I just recently mm -hmm. found out that 52% uh, of me is from Benning, South Africa, or West Africa. Um, and my, when I told my son, who's in the Navy, he was so excited about it. Mm -hmm. It was as if I had just, he woke up and said, oh, well, now I want to find out about my ancestry. Mm -hmm. So we have to find creative ways to get them involved so we can pass that torch. Mm -hmm. So 48% of me is Kimberly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, I'm, and, and, they are, and then I think it's like, well, 15 to 6, Ivory Coast. So I started researching, okay, where did all the, the bulk of the African American people come from? And the, and the strangest thing, my, my daughter, my baby daughter, is married to a, to a Cameroonian. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's where he's wow. from, 100% Cameroonian. Mm -hmm. And when she's doing hers, she was criticizing him, oh, you know, I'm not from, and when it came up, she looked at him and looked at him. Jesus Lord. <laughs> You're married to Travis. <laughs> she was like, I don't believe this. Yeah. But you know, it's we don't really know. Yeah. You don't. We tell you tap into you that. Do it. That's right. And you know, years ago, especially when Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. And if one point one percent blood was African American, you were African American. Yeah. Right. So people, you know, that's why some people don't do their ancestors because they, they don't want to know. <laughs> they don't want to know. They don't want to know. And it's, it's yeah. because they say, I mean, I have a girlfriend, you know, she's white. She's like, oh, I don't want to know because I don't want my parents and we do it back in the day. So I don't want to know. <laughs> I don't want to know. So I said, yeah, come on, man. She's like, oh, no, baby. I, I can tell you stories and I just don't want to know. Yeah. yeah, but what you and she was offended because she would be African American, she didn't know what else she might be. Yeah, well, at least we have the history, mm -hmm. and thank God that you have taken on that torch to provide us yeah. with that so we have something to go back to. Mm -hmm. Had it not been for your dedication, you know, to researching and finding this, we wouldn't have anything. Yeah, so I commend you um, for thank you. the work that you. Because yes. it's very, very valuable. And um, our younger generation, they'll find out soon enough because yeah. they too will become our age. That's right. My dad right. always said uh, when people write people's obituary, this drives me crazy. Oh, Lord, I just went through that. And <laughs> you don't put the accurate information. I'm a stickler for if you're not going to tell the truth, don't say nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't say nothing. You know, because just just leave it alone. Yes. Because that's a that's a record. Yes. That's a record. And yes. don't yeah. understand. If his name was something else, don't call him boo boo on here. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Exactly. Yeah. If that wasn't his birth name, give him give him dignity as he's leaving this earth. Yes. I think at a certain point you should write your own obituary. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Definitely. You should get it started. Write yeah, your definitely. Own write yeah. Your own history. And write it accurately because. If you don't write it after me, when you're dead and gone, they'll find out. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Like your grandchildren and your great grandchildren. I'm gonna say he did so and so. That's not right. Uh -huh. Like when Reverend Gould was saying, oh, it's for that that came to the school. And I said, Reverend Gould, he died in 1806. This building was built in 1859. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. I never thought about it that way. Yeah. So we forget. There is records that can back up a lot of things that Fact African checking. American, you've got to do your checks and points. Mm -hmm. And we need to remember our obituary is very, 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 very important. I had the honor of writing my grandmother's recently, and it was very nerve wracking. Um, I had what, Robert, four days? I had four days to compile her life. She was 99. And she was 99, and most of her contemporaries had already passed on. And most of her siblings, um, a lot of her siblings passed on. And even the siblings that are alive, they're in their 70s, they couldn't remember some of the pieces of, their, of her younger life. So it was very, like you said, it was very difficult yes. to write that. And um, I do encourage people, please 
start now. <laughs> you know, while you have your right mind, while everything is lucid, put your details together, especially for your younger life. Um, because my grandmother, she only, she only told us about a certain portion of her life, not her early years. So it was hard to get that information put yeah. together. Oh, yeah, I was and piggybacking off of Shantae's comment about her grandmother. Uh, I had to watch her go through 100 years of history in four days. It was powerful, but because of her, her acumen for historical research, and she's published several books as well, she knew how to put all that together. She wrote the obituary where it was very well thought through, it was thorough, and her um, sister, her grandmother's sister, who was alive and caretaking the property and all that, conferred and said that this is what it is. Okay, that was the first thing. The second thing that we have to do is that we have to understand that in the technology age we're living in now, you must create something that brings an interest to all people. Okay, so she had a historical record, right? But what we had to do is using the arts community, took arts and graphics and creativity, we created an obituary program that was literally like a, a art book, okay? It had color, it had texture, it had dynamics, it had a lot of the flavors of, of urban culture in there and current culture. So when we did it, everybody was blown away by the program booklet. So what happened is there was an emotional incentive because of the creativity of how something was presented, yeah. okay? And that creativity of how something was presented etched in the obituary to the individuals who watched it. Now, the lady who, who oversaw, who was the MC for the program, uh, she called uh, my wife's aunt and wanted to talk to us because she said in her 30 plus years, she was a reverend doctor, somebody, really big somebody, said in her 30 plus years of doing this work, she's never seen something like this. And everybody wanted to keep that piece of obituary as it was a piece of artwork to put on the wall. So that's something we have to make sure we do, that we don't just put information out there, that we put things out there in a way that's creative and inspiring to people to want to engage in it. And because what happens is, art brings an emotional channel to the soul. Okay, so now if we can get that art as an emotional channel to the soul, then the information that we need to, to carry will be etched in there. That's why rap is so important. That's why the one guy who has edutainment, who made up that thing, how they're doing so successful with these things. So we, in our sense, in the, uh, the sunset generation, we have to make sure that as you're presenting things, it's not just information, that there is presented in a way where it can go into the heart and soul of individuals in a creative sense, as well as historical basis. So that's something that we like to do when we design our museums or we do an artwork or things like that. For instance, when we were just at the uh, at the Harriet Tubman Museum, the architect who did that work, we had a great time with him, okay? And he studied how the thought process and how moving from the south to the north, how he designed the building. But when they, the building itself became artwork, and then going through the building was like art. So when people went through that place, there was a capture of emotion about even being on the ground mm -hmm. that merged itself with his, the history of the person who the ground was representing. So there's a twofold thing we have to do. And I just shut my mouth down and, and turn back <laughs> over. But thank you very much uh, for that. And you're yeah. absolutely correct. And you know, and some, something interesting that has happened to me and, and what it is I've been doing in, in life. And because some people are just totally forgotten. And at least twice I've had calls from the Sun paper asking for permission to use uh, my interview with a person like down in Turner Station on mm -hmm. the family that owned the bar, uh, I just can't think of their name. Mm -hmm. Totally, no one knew anything about it, but it was in my book. And that pleased me so much mm -hmm. because A, they both had her and all, she was saying about her, with the images, and they did such a nice job putting it together. Hey, uh, that's another thing that I like about and that's why we need to know about history. Sometimes you don't know nothing at all about your grandmother or great grandmother, yes. but it's maybe right there in the, in the book somewhere. Mm -hmm. And we do have a program here. We had a donation of uh, hundred money for this screen and that, thing, so that we can have classes mm -hmm. in genealogy. Great. And we started off with some. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, 
I think I had something like a thousand rolls of uh, microfilm. Wow. But the, uh, uh, what's the organization? Freeman Bureau? Freeman Bureau. No, not the Bureau. No. It's the state. Um, oh, uh, the, the, the state federal. archives? No, no, no. After they digitized the film in the library up in New York. Yeah. Okay. The Freeman Project? It's called Freeman something. The Freeman's Project. No, no, no. no? The Freeman Project. It's just the oh. microfilm that they had in the library up there. Uh, digitized. Right. And they would give those to anyone as a non profit running a museum. Okay. And I got the, which I got it for? Maybe yeah. hundred, many more than hundreds of reels of, but we lost our, our, our lady that we could give to. We would have never been able to get over that. And I would love that, that stuff. Mm -hmm. Goodness. Well, anyhow, I think we best call it quits now. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in. I'll have this up in a moment. Hope you enjoy.